uh, which she has been doing fearlessly for, what, three years now? Yeah, no, this will be the start of the fourth season. Yeah, right? so um, she was formerly our horticulture agent, uh, went on to Greener Pastures at Family Consumer Sciences, which I was happy about. Um, so I got my job. Uh, and before that, you've done a lot of work in Arizona. You've kind of done a lot of amazing work leading both um, private sector and public sector groups and kind of just all over the place. And so uh, we are in capable and happy hands. So with that, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Ashley. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Sherilyn Berry, and I am the local foods coordinator and the family and consumer sciences agent here. So um, one thing that's really unique in Durham is that we have a beautiful community garden, um, so we're able to do, to do seed-to-table food education. We can teach people how to grow food, how to cook food, um, all different age groups and abilities. Um, and what's so great is that Briggs is an approved garden site for you to get hours. So um, if you've never planted a seed before in your life, and you want to learn how to grow vegetables, um, vegetables, fruits, things like that. Uh, if you want to get into bees a little bit, um, we have an ag education site, a 10 minute drive from here, down the freeway, just a few exits down the freeway, uh, where people come and it's open to everyone. So it is, it, does, it runs a little bit different than a regular community garden. Um, we have about 60 beds that um, there are plot owners, families that run those beds, but then we have banks of beds where we grow food uh, for Durham Technical Community College, they have a little uh, food pantry. And so we grow all their fresh foods. They get commodity foods um, in their pantry and then we provide their fresh foods in their refrigerators there. So it's really fun and exciting. Um, we also get Durham Tech students to work on Fridays, which is so great because I have Master Gardeners help me run it and they're sort of the, um, the uh, voice of reason and advice, and then there's all this young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, strong-backed labor uh, to come and do whatever we need. And that's great because it allows us to be able to keep um, some of the families that have elders that maybe have a hard time getting down the hill or can't really lift things anymore, they can stay with us because they can just kind of put in their order, oh, I would like to turn my bed over or whatever, and we have all the youngins help us with it. So um, we also do uh, field trips in the summer. Um, we kind of grow a food museum in the summertime where we grow some of the hottest chilies in the world, a bunch of weird tomatoes, um, 10 different colors of eggplants, so that people can come through and see that you know, yeah, there's some stuff there that you can get from the grocery store, but there's also weird peppers that look like peach-colored wasps, and there, yes, there are orange and pink uh, eggplants, and there are black tomatoes, um, so it's a really, really fun place to garden and play, and, and you're all welcome to come down. Um, also, uh, we collaborate with the Durham County Beekeeping Association and do the bee school every year here in this, um, here in this office. Um, and they train usually 40 new beekeepers a year, but this year they're training 60 because our population is growing and we want people to be beekeepers rather than bee havers, and there's a difference. And so uh, what's great about uh, Briggs is there's an apiary <clears throat> where we have, um, we got a grant from Burt's Bees to buy us about 20 suits. So you can come out there, get your hands dirty, get in the bees before you spend hundreds of dollars on equipment and then get discouraged because your bees died in the first season. So we like to get, get people, especially young people, you know, so there's a lot of actually kids in bee school this year, um, which is pretty exciting, but I encourage their parents to bring them to breaks first so that they don't end up with a bunch of stinging insects in their backyard that, uh, um, that, they, that the kids aren't taking care of. So, uh, so yeah, you're welcome to come and join us and play around anytime. Um, so food is my life. I love growing food, cooking food. I've grown food in desert environments, tropical environments. This is a subtropical environment. Um, and so there are different techniques uh, depending on where you are. And, uh, and we're going to talk about how we do it here in the Piedmont region. It's going to differ in different places. I know some of you are from other states. Um, and some of the stuff you may hear here, you say, oh, that's not how we did it in Texas, or that's not how we did it in Louisiana. It's because this is the Piedmont, and it's a little bit different. That being said, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so there are other ways to do stuff um, that uh, are or are not research-based, based on whatever kind of your landscape is and, um, and your techniques and past. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the variability on some of the... Um, planting calendars that you'll see. What I brought for you is a little chotch piece today. I mean, the loop is the best gift you're gonna to get today. But there's also some little, there's some seeds here. If you'd like to help yourself, I've got um, some little bags. I have tons of these, so don't worry if uh, we run out. I have a whole case of them. And some little markers, just label your bag, and then um, take some of these seeds so that you can plant them throughout the year if you'd like. Um, and then also we have the Central Carolina planting calendar. If any of you are gonna work in public events, 
and go out there and, uh, and talk to the public. This is a really, really wonderful resource. Um, and uh, fortunately, Panna, uh, your fearless coordinator, um, will be able to, she prints these off by the thousands in the years. And uh, she actually handed me a big stack of these for you today. So these are, these are just really nice. They're always going to be in those public events packs. And uh, Durham, yeah, people are interested in pollinators, they're interested in bees, they're interested in um, a lot of different kinds of gardening, but they're really, really interested. This is a foodie town, so you're going to get a lot of questions about um, starting vegetable gardens and, um, you know, you can always, if, if you're out in the public and someone's like, oh, I wish I could start a vegetable garden, but I don't know what to do, talk to them about it, but if they don't have enough sun, you can always send them my way and we can always work them into breaks or at least give them a tour on a work day. It's a very inspiring place to be. So uh, right now it's a big muddy mess out there, <laughs> but I encourage you, um, I'm actually gonna be one of your chauffeurs on your field trip. So we're gonna do Briggs and, um, and the soil lab in a day. And it'll be great to see it now when it's a mucky mess and then to come back in the summer when everything is so full in bloom and the trees and the vines are heavy with fruit and you can't even see through the fence. There's so many berries. Um, it's a nice comparison because right now it's a hot mess, but we're trying to work. This has been the win wettest winter on record for sure. So, um, so yeah, vegetable gardening. So check that out. And let's talk about um, how to plant here in the Okay. So we're going to talk about site selection and growing systems for different kinds of vegetable gardens. Um, soil preparation is of utmost importance. I think soils is the first class that you guys did um, this year. Uh, and uh, very uh, interesting and uh, very important topic. So um, soil is always where you start. A lot of times people just go and like stick a tomato plant in the ground and they, they feel like they have a black thumb because their plant died. But if they didn't test the soil and amend the soil and do all those things, then they're not going to be successful. Plus, they usually pick to grow a tomato first, which is the hardest, most finicky thing out there. And we'll talk about that. Yet it's still America's favorite garden vegetable. So um, don't let anybody get discouraged. They're like, I tried to, I kept some basil in a pot and it died. I'm terrible. Like, no, it's basil in a pot in your house. You was already like definitely stacked against it to start. So uh, you know, just send them my way. I can help them with the growing food. We've turned many green thumbs in my time, so no problem. Um, and plant nutrition, very important. Um, maintenance and pest management, very important in the Piedmont. And one of the reasons that I moved to this place, I used to live in Arizona, I did a lot of really amazing gardening out there, but vegetables were very cheap and water was very expensive. So it was mainly more for my um, comfort and health to look out the backyard and see the beautiful garden, but that cost me way more than all of the practically free vegetables that you can get coming up from the international produce courts out of Mexico. So you can get 10 pounds of carrots for a dollar. Out here, it's not the same. Water's free, falling out of the sky, and one organic pepper is $2.49. So gardening out here really does increase food security for families and for you um, and your health. And there's just something so amazing about what I call yard food. Like uh, just walking out and having just all of these vegetables and fruits just available for you um, is a really a wonderful, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, my dad makes fun of me, he thinks that I'm a doomsday prepper because I have like a seed bank and I, I, do, I make soap and I uh, you know, help with your animals and all this stuff and he makes fun of me that um, I'm going to build a bunker, which is not true. But uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're pioneering skills. But there is this, such comfort when you look out your backyard and there's just food there all the time. And you know, I look out and I'm like, oh, right now I have tons of kale and collards that have overwintered all winter long, tons of spinach. I'm like, I have like $500 worth of vegetables out there right now. <laughs> or I'll pick like a little handful. I'm like, they want $3.99 for this at Whole Foods. So it's just like a good feeling. So uh, vegetable crops, we'll talk about cool season and warm season crops. And then the difference between annuals and perennials and what you can kind of grow as both. Um, so site selection. You're going to get questions about this all the time. Either, oh, I, I want to grow a lawn for some reason, my grass won't grow, or uh, I would like to be able to grow a vegetable garden, but nothing would grow. And my first question is, you know, always, you know, test your soil. But if grass won't grow in a spot, vegetables are not going to grow in a spot because you need a good amount of sunlight every day. So if they've got a bunch of moss growing, they can't grow vegetables there. That's a, you know, wet shady area. Um, I usually send them to a local community garden um, to, to grow food there or they can knock down a bunch of trees. So it's kind of up to them what they want to do. And some people even argued with me about it. I was like, why not? But it's like, this is the sunlight. Like, so, what's so interesting about plants in general, but definitely vegetables, what I really love, but every plant that you see, 
you know, they come up above the ground and they're autotrophs. They capture light and air and make starch out of it, which I think is completely mind-blowing. Um, but you need the sunlight, otherwise there's no power to make that CO2 turn into carbohydrates. So, um, yeah, send, send it to me. We'll get them growing stuff. Um, you need good drainage because uh, plants don't like to, they're, not all plants like their feet wet. Um, you have to prepare the soil the right way the first time. If you do it right the first time, you don't have to mess with it. It's just a little bit of work and money at the beginning, but if you do it right the first time, you can set it and forget it, basically. Um, you need pH between 6 and 6.5. Plants like it, or vegetable plants like it, just slightly <clears throat> acidic. Um, but if you're right at neutral at 7, that's fine too. Always test your soil. Don't just start throwing lime on it. Um, and if you do, I'm sure you learned during the soil section that if you are going to do a vegetable garden, it's good to keep a little journal just to start, especially if you're starting out because you need to kind of log where, you know, you grew tomatoes last year, um, where you grew your beans last year because you want to rotate crops. Um, you want to know um, when you added lime. So if you have a soil test, pop that right there in your little binder. Yes? We actually haven't had soil yet. Oh, sorry guys. That's like three I've, classes ahead. Sorry, sorry so, guys. So, Last time it was so tell us all about soil. So it's okay. So it's so um, uh, soil testing is free here in North Carolina from April to November, and then um, November to April it's four dollars. We do deliver them here. Um, if people bring them to this office, we deliver them to the soil lab. So um, and that's great. It's a free service, but actually your taxes already pay for it, so you might as well just get what you've already paid for. Um, so uh, definitely do that. If your soil is anywhere outside of this range, like too far on one side or the other um, from vegetables, they won't be able to uptake nutrients from the soil. But there's a lot of things that you can do to change that lime. You add lime, and it makes it more alkaline this way on the, the scale. Um, and if you add things like a ton of coffee grounds and pine needles, it's going to move it to acidic, and then you can grow like blueberries and azaleas. So it just depends on the individual plants and what pH they like to be able to uptake the nutrients from the soil. So um, so that's why when you look at this. So um, I, with my soil test, have discovered that my vegetable garden is actually slightly alkaline. Mm -hmm. And what I did with a little bit of my research was it looked like Bermuda green veg vegetables and brassicas actually like alkaline soil. At least that's what I saw. And no, so, and, and, and what was interesting is that's the stuff that just goes crazy good in my garden. Mm -hmm. And it, so it seemed to sort of, so it was interesting that, I mean, what's your thought about that? I mean, is that true that the leafy greens, the brassicas like it? Brassicas are your buddies. They, so as long as it's not hot, hot, they're like, I wish people didn't start with tomatoes and they started with brassicas. Okay. Because they're, except for when it's hot and they get attacked by cabbage loopers, they're so chill. They, you just throw them there, they overwinter fine, yep. you know, they grow, they can grow real close together, they can grow real far apart, they can grow, you know, 7.5 even up to 8, um, you know, soils. Uh, so, because I've been from, you know, I, I've grown in the tropics, which is very acidic, you know, well-draining volcanic soil, all the way over to um, caliche, uh, alkaline desert soils. So, um, and brassicas do well, no matter what. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the fruits in the summer, the tomatoes, the, the peppers, the eggplants that are a little bit more finicky. Yes? Can you use salsa to get more acidic? You probably could, but um, we don't need to do anything usually more acidic here, though. Usually, generally speaking, our soils are already acidic, the clay soils that we have. So, not yours. Yeah, there's little not patches high. where I've seen uh, just only like maybe once or twice have I seen a soil read out that's like 7.5. Like, where do you live? You know? So, yeah. So, you know, it just it kind of just depends on where you are. But as long as it's not too far out of the spectrum, you should be fine, especially if you're doing raised beds, which I'll show you some of those, because okay. um, you can adjust it with compost. Um, I wouldn't add a bunch of sulfur with uh, with, with the brass, I guess, <coughs> because they're sulfuropanes and they already okay. aggregate yeah, sulfur in the soil as yeah. it is. So, um, so yeah, but brass, because are super chill. Okay, so you they need adequate nutrients and a consistent water supply, which has not been a problem this winter, but apparently like five years ago there was a drought in the summer, you know? So um, we have very schizophrenic weather here. It can be like desert dry or completely swampy wet, and you just got to kind of roll with it, which is why I like raised beds, because you can control the environment a little bit more. 
um, and, and the depth of your soil. Okay, slide's so broken. Um, full sun, well-drained soil where the water doesn't stand after rainfall, and the water source close by. Okay, so this is the first question I always ask people is where's your irrigation? Um, I've seen community gardens, they would build a fence and the beds and everything, and they did not have a water source. So then they planted a bunch of plants, it got dry, and they were literally filling buckets at their homes and driving them out there with trucks, which is not a good idea. So don't put a garden where you don't have irrigation. Um, it's not hard to pull like a line over and pop a hose bib. It's, it's, it's not that hard to do, but that is an investment. When, when it's hot in the summer, because in the summer it can be brutal here. Um, it's just so humid and hot, and the plants are stressed, and you're trying to like heave water out to them when they need it the most, and then you're like passing out. So um, always have your water close to the garden, otherwise don't put a garden there. And then modify your soil based on your, your test results. Um, always mix compost into our soil. We're going to talk about that pretty well here. Um, we don't have a loamy soil here. We either have sand or we have clay in North Carolina, generally speaking, unless you're like somewhere in an old forest or something where it's been pitching down, like a deciduous forest where it's been pitching down leaves for years and years and years and years, and then you might have a good, like a nice soil layer. Um, but otherwise, you're pretty much going to need to buy compost and incorporate it in, or make your own compost and incorporate it in. Um, so choose what fits your space, space and needs. The three types we're, the kinds we're going to talk about today are traditional rows, raised beds, and containers. Containers are great, but they do require a little bit more intervention because they need to be watered every day in the summer, even sometimes twice a day in the summer. Um, okay, rows are like really efficient, especially if you're doing um, like the same kind of crop, bunches and bunches of the same kind of crop. So if you say you're going to have 50 people over um, for your Thanksgiving dinner and uh, you want to do like a traditional southern meal, you're going to do rows and rows and rows of collard greens because they cook down. Um, and this, this is really efficient because you can look out and you can see which plants are diseased, which ones are doing better. Um, but it's not really necessarily like a biointensive method where you have like microclimates within a bed and things like that. So this is more like a traditional farming. Um, but if you have the space and say you're like a big canner and you want just loads and loads of tomatoes, um, you can absolutely do this. And you know, if you have the space, it is a very efficient way to um, get sort of a lot for uh, a little bit of time which is good, but most people don't have this kind of space, especially in Durham where we're increasingly more urban, and so plots of land are smaller and smaller and smaller. They're putting a ticky-tacky house I live on, about a third of an acre, and um, they're putting ticky-tacky houses all around us that are these McMansions with a poster stamp backyard. So, you know, and we're lucky because we have, you know, a little edible landscape where we are because we have a good amount of land to work with. I still don't have rows, though. I still do beds. So, um, uh, best one planning to grow large volumes of produce. Sorry if it seems like I'm going through these. There's 102 of these slides, so I don't want to lose out because the end is like way fun because we talk about all the different kinds of vegetables. So, okay. Um, uh, rows are made with a plow or mounted with a shovel. So I want to show you this. See how these rows are mounted up? You really want that because then when it rains, the water can wash over them. The plant can take what it needs, but it's not going to end up being you know, swamped. If you were in the desert, you would actually dig a hole so that when the water ran over it, it would fall in the hole because it rains so infrequently. But here it's different. You really do need to pop these guys up. Um, and then it also makes it easier to mulch and easier to harvest because the plant's actually taller. You don't have to bend over so far to get it. So um, always give yourself a little mound when you're doing, um, when you're doing the rose drainage is much, much better. So um, something to keep in mind is that anything that you plant, you want to be able to reach to the middle of it. So it should never be more than four feet wide. Um, and then also, you want a space to be able to get your whatever tools you have, a wagon or a wheelbarrow. So think about that. Don't plant them in one big, thick block unless it's corn, which we'll talk about later. Um, you want to be able to wheel, like, you know, as you're walking along, weeding and stuff like that. It's nice to have a little wagon because then you don't have to lift things. Ergonomic, always, you know, the Ohio way, only handle it once. So um, you just truck through and then take it right to the compost bin. Um, wheels are awesome. So. Um, rows can be wide enough for a single line. Um, wide, two, two feet to three feet beds is perfect. Four feet maximum. And then your little, your little space in between. This is my favorite, raised beds, especially in this environment that we're in. Uh, raised beds are really the best that you can do. Um, I'll often see people, this is a double stack, so that's not bad in the community garden. They started with a single stack, 
And after we've done, like, I don't like having grass next to my raised beds. Um, I do cardboard and wood chip like this. You put cardboard down and wood chip on top, and then you don't have to mow around these, and it chokes out the weeds, and so the weeds won't want to come up into your bed. It also continues to build the soil, but as you cardboard and wood chip once a year, it will bury this bed, so you can put a double stack right on top of it after that. I'll often see people put um, weed block underneath this. Don't do that. Don't do that, because you want your plants, like a carrot loves eight feet. A carrot grows best when it has eight feet of space because there's all those, you know, you yank out that tap root, and if you've ever yanked out a fresh carrot, it's got all those hairy little micro roots on it. Those go way down into the soil, and they're actually bringing up nutrients for itself and other plants around it. So you want to give it space. So you can cut off the grass there, or you can even choke it out with cardboard for a, you know, a month or two, and then um, pull it off of there. Um, you're going to dig down about eight inches, pull the soil out, mix it 50-50 with compost, and put it back in. And that's going to fluff it up and fill that up. And then after that, because on here I mentioned tilling a couple of times, do not, tillers are to be rented or borrowed, not to be purchased. Because a tiller is only used when you're prepping a bed once. If you do it right, this was talking about set it and forget it, if you do it right the first time, you shouldn't have to till it again. So um, tilling is not good because it breaks up all of the uh, little uh, tunnels that subterranean creatures have made for your, uh, for your plants. Um, you know, worms are crawling around in here and they're eating and pooing and, you know, their guano is a very, very expensive fertilizer. And so then once they, you know, trucked past this little whatever bean plant, um, the little bean plant can put a root right down that little tunnel that the, that the um, worm went through. So if you take a tiller and you just rip it up that subterranean city, it, the, they have to do it all over again. So there's a ton of research about this. No-till gardening is much, much better for the soil, much better for your back, um, much better for your time as well. And you just continue, continue to feed the top of the soil after that. But digging down eight to 12 inches and pulling out the soil and mixing it back with compost, putting it back in and your initial lime, um, uh, when you do your first soil test, if it says, you know, you need eight pounds of lime or whatever, you would mix that in, you know, it'll tell you per square footage. Um, and you would mix that in. Now your pH is right, your, uh, your mic, you know, you're setting up the microbiological world under there, right? Um, and then after that, you just keep putting compost on top of it. And, you know, you can cut it in, but you're not going to rip it up like you did the very first time. So, yes? I have to the raised bed. You absolutely could. I don't know that I would put it over your French drain, though, because um, there's, I don't know, we, look, show me what you're talking about, and I can help you with that. Because you, you also don't want to lose, like, you don't want plant roots growing down into your French drain, and also whatever your water you might like running right down into your French drain. So we'll look at it together. Okay. Can I ask you, um, sorry, could you speak to how much compost would you into a space is I heard my son's uh, folks who have said that it's actually too much of a good thing and you can start to lose stability. Like what's a good guideline? Like an inch. An inch a season. An inch a season. Yeah, an inch maybe. And then if you're having more settling or you need more fill, it's a good garden soil. Um, yeah, you have to be careful with garden soils. Um, people will just go and get topsoil because they're ripping up the forest yeah. everywhere. You have to be careful of where you get it. So if anything, cut it half or use the native soil in your landscape. So if you, say, dig up a French drain, don't get rid of that soil. Hold on to it, and then if you have to add two, you can add two. But cut it with compost in half. And then, um, and yeah, but usually, you know, when you make the soil richer and richer, as long as you're not overdoing it, you're going to cut it half with compost on your first deal. And then after that, as you're adding it, like I've, I've never actually had any problems with it, except for sometimes the sourced compost can have issues based on whatever the feedstocks they put in it. Um, we've had some issues with some tomato stuff over the last couple of years. Um, and nobody can quite really tell if it's the compost or if, you know, I think after about the last couple of years, I can pretty much tell whenever we grow in that compost that happens. But, um, but you know, uh, they're not actually able to tell, you know, what is in it and what's actually causing the problem. So, um, but if it's clean compost from clean um, sources, as long as you don't overdo it. So I wouldn't take a plant and stick it directly in compost because it's sometimes too hot or too rich and it can actually kill the plant. 
So um, just be careful of where you get the topsoil from. Like if someone has acreage, go out and dig up some stuff at the base of a tree or something that's going to be better than just buying whatever from, you know. But sometimes you have to go with whatever if you have a large area, like a really huge bed, um, and you need a lot of soil. So. Does compost increase phosphorus? Uh, based, based on the feedstocks that are in it. So okay. usually, yeah, because it's made from plants a lot of the time. So, But it's never going to be the same as fertilizer. So right. fertilizer is fertilizer, compost is compost. And so there are nutrients in compost. If you've already got a high phosphorus, you shouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, I can compost it here. I wouldn't. No, okay. not usually. Yeah. Well, and it, it does leach out of the soil quickly. So, and of course, with our high clay content soil. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the name of soil because the good thing about clay is all the nutrients. Right? Yeah, it is. Our, our clay is like a vitamin pill. It's just that it's so acidic and compact that plants can't access it. So, you know, we're lucky. We're not on the coast where it's just sand, where you have to add stuff to it just to get it to hold anything in. Ours holds plenty in, but it is. It's like a vitamin pill. But when you break it up with compost and um, bring the pH to 6 to 7, um, the plants can actually access it, and water can actually drain through it. So our soil is really great and nutritious. You just have to amend it. Um, yeah, so I have beds similar to this in my yard, but they're double stacks, and I have a red cap around, so I can sit on the edge of the bed and tend the bed. Um, this is what, not what you would do in a rental, because it's expensive and labor intensive, because I have a slight angle to my land, and so we had to cut the bricks in so that they're, they're level. Um, but it's really nice, because it's like you have a garden party or whatever, and you can sit on the edge of these, which is really nice. Also, I'll put down a, um, like an Indian blanket and lay on it put my knees on it and then I can like reach over the bed and work in the bed and it's just um, nice and ergonomic. So um, yeah, that's a big garden. But again, I cardboard and wood chip because it's way too much maintenance right here. It's way too much maintenance and mowing and then also tearing out whatever grows up in the bed. So, um, and wood chips are free y'all, do not buy them. Just be patient and somebody will drop them in your house for free. Yes. Um, it looks like those <laughs> blocks are, have um, spaces. The, 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 it's not a solid surface presented uh, to the sky. So does that hold, do they hold water? They do. I can't mind. Some people will grow, they'll put soil in here and like grow things out of them, but it just makes the bed too wide for me. Um, I like having a border that I can sit on or put tools on, things like that. Um, but you, you know, you, you don't even, they're not even cemented in. You lay them this way and then you lay the next one halfway over and then you can just get a capper. They sell cappers for like a dollar and you pop that on the top of it with like a little bench. So um, you could turn them the other way, but they're more stable and they don't shift around as much if you lay them this way because they, they like settle into the soil a little better and a little more even. The, I think my question was, do they hold water? It, it, is there a couple of inches of water in that If it rains, that then seeps down more slowly into the soil? It so does. It's, so if it's only going to rain once for two weeks and you know that, mm -hmm. then that's something that will help it will, but it's also a mosquito fest. Yeah. So yeah. just cool yeah. 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 When you said use wood chips, can you also use sawdust? Like if you were doing wood for Yeah, you know, you could use sawdust. I would just be careful. It's, it can't be treated lumber. You don't want to put like methyl bromide or whatever they're treating with. It's, it's got that green hue to it. Um, avoid using, if you're going to use lumber, don't use treated lumber what you're gonna use next to your food. Use, there's there's like things you can treat with that don't leach into soil. Um, there's all these eco things that you can spray on it that are good, but I would not get that grease treated lumber with it. That being said, if you already did it, don't worry, you won't die, but it, I just, I don't really, you know, I like to try to keep the chemicals away as much as possible with your agent hampers. Um, for the uh, wood chips, is that being from like arborists? Yeah, you can call up any of the tree services and you put your name on a list. It may take up to a month um, and they, you know, you can call them and hound them a little bit if you want to, but just, you know, call four or five of them, write down and remember which ones you did because once you get enough wood chips, all of a sudden it's like feast or famine and they'll fill your entire front yard. So, um, you know, so, but yeah, they'll drop them off for free because the tree companies, when they chip those, they have to pay to dump them in the dump. And so it's actually nice because they don't end up in a landfill, they're free, and they don't have to pay to dump them. So it's kind of a win-win-win situation. Hold on, she wears her clothes. Oh, I was just gonna say that the, the fresh wood chips, in order to decompose, it has to leach nitrogen out of the soil. So I guess if we have this border that helps, but what if the border is there and it's, it's lime, tinderbox? Is that lime gonna leach into the bed? 
No, no, uh -uh. I mean, because, you know, like initially, you know, yeah, there's a little dust on them or something, but no, no, uh -uh. They, they, they don't really, um, they don't really disintegrate or anything. So, yeah, I haven't had any problems with them. Yeah. Um, but, oh, the, uh, you're talking about the wood chips. It's true, you never put fresh wood chips on the surface of your soil for mulch because in order to break down carbon, it's going to need a lot of nitrogen and it'll starve your plants. But that's perfect to put on top of grass because that's what you're trying to do is starve it out. So, cardboard, wood chips. So, else there's another hand up? Yes. Are, are they just cinder blocks? Just regular cinder blocks, dollar twenty-five or whatever in your big box store. Yeah. So if I, if I pulled up like a you know ask one of and they said I can pick for you know one of my large town chips, would they just turn You just ask them wherever they're at and they'll gladly turn that chipper around and fill it back in your truck. Because it's less sex to take them to dump. So yes. Sorry, last question I hope here. Um I mean, the book referred to raised beds that didn't have sides. So you're not putting wood down, you're not using rock, you are just putting enough soil to prevent it. Yeah, you can. You've seen it, try it, it all washes away. It, do you do have erosion issues. If I did something like that, I would probably, what I would do in that situation is probably put burlap around the edges or something. Because if you have the rain like we've had over this winter, or if you're on any kind of slope or anything like that, you could really have issues with erosion. So I like a little frame with it because it's cleaner too. Yeah. So, you know, it's just really. And then there's things like Google culture, which we can get into on another day where you're putting down like logs and rotting vegetables or whatever, and then you build up this mound and plant things in the side of it. I mean, that's another thing that you can do too, but that's a whole other talk. Um, but that's a different kind of bed that you kind of like over the next, you know, many years, right. it'll break down and break down and continue to get richer and richer. So um, that's a really fun way to do it. Um, okay, highly recommend it. Size, yes, no more than four foot wide, we talked about that. Uh, length depends on materials using and space. So yeah, there's eight foot boards, 12 foot boards, things like that. They're gonna be sturdier and last longer. If they aren't gigantic, like 16 foot boards, it's better to go with them a little bit shorter. Um, it also gives you the ability to have multiple beds to be able to remember and cycle your crops a little bit easier. Um, so if you had tomatoes in this bed, you're gonna put them in the next bed the next year. Um, minimum eight inch deep, they can be higher, especially for easy access. So just like we talked about, since it's got a cardboard wood chip action right here, um, just don't put the um, weed block underneath. If you had to, I'd put a layer of cardboard and then plants in it, and then eventually the cardboard will break down and your subterranean creatures could get up in there um, to eat and, and hang out in the soil and uh, feed your soil and then your plant roots can get below. So give me a more contact. Um, okay, so there's some beautiful spinach and stuff. Um, so we talked about eliminating the weeds before you build the beds. Um, some people will spray them with Roundup or glyphosate or whatever. Some people will just choke them out with um, uh, with the um, cardboard, and some people will literally dig them up. So it's really kind of up to you how much time and energy that you have. Just avoid tilling them in, um, especially if there's seed heads on them. That could be a real problem. Um, so if you're making it over a hard surface, make it at least two feet, preferably three feet deep. So sometimes I've seen like, there's a, Croisdale has a beautiful community garden, but they laid a, a parking lot before they put the beds on it. Oh, and when I went to look at it, I was like, can they bust through that concrete for you? And they were like, no, they can. I'm like, well, then they need to be like this high. Um, it's really best, not only for the ergonomics retirement community, so the ergonomics, of the people that are gardening there, but then also so the plant roots can actually, you know, can get as far as they can, they're gonna stop at the concrete. But you can still, it's just like growing in a big container. So you have to feed it a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit more, um, I would say, it's because it's like a gigantic pot. Um, it's a little bit more, of a, you know, tenuous. The plants are not as drought resistant um, as if they had access to the soil underneath it. Um, we talked about 50 to 70%, 75% soil in compost. Um, I like the 50-50 compost soil mix, that works great. Um, you can make a bed using 100% soilless media, but you gotta water more often. Also, like, soil is like wonderful, and um, and it's, uh, you know, ours is like that big vitamin pill, so um, when people wanna do some, you know, the, we'll talk about, uh, you know, hay bale gardening and things like that. I just see it as, for economics, if you're gonna spend a ton of money on something, I like a set it and forget it situation. I don't want to spend more on the um, 
pot and, and vegetables and stuff, then it, it, it's got to be cheaper than me buying the vegetables. You know what I mean? So, yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, our soil is great. Use it. Um, okay, so this is one of these things that, you know, there was a couple people at Briggs that wanted to give this a whirl, and I'm all about, you know, if people are dedicated and they want to try something new, I'm like, sure, we'll buy you a bale and take some of the, you know, uh, whatever, fertilizer and, you know, try it out. Um, these, to me, are a big old mess because you have, to, you have to get one of these, wet it down, and then use a bunch of fertilizer to start breaking it down. These are, this is all carbon, and you got to put nitrogen, you got to put everything in it to feed a plant. And so you end up spending whatever 40, 50 bucks on everything you need for it, and then it it doesn't last forever. This is gonna break down and fall apart after that first season, and now you just have a mess you need moving around. Now this would be great compost, don't get me wrong, but like how many tomatoes did you get for your 50 bucks? So when the soil is like great already, I would use this as mulch for the tomatoes you know, before I'd like to do one of these. But I'm all about like, hey, we beneath your wings, give it a whirl, curl. And they got like eight tomatoes off of it. I'm like, awesome, we know that didn't work. And then I, you know, we, <laughs> it was like, whatever works for you. But in the desert, actually, a lot of people do this. Um, and they actually, there's a method where you kind of dig this out and put soil in it. So it's interesting, you do have more disease-free tomatoes. Some people are really into this. Craig Lulia, the NC Tomato Man, he's all about it. And great, go for it, awesome. But I'm more of a soil gal myself. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Craig does everything on his driveway. He doesn't have a lot of land. And so he used to do these little, like, um, little bags to make, you know, bags to grow his tomatoes in, a little controlled environment. But yeah, most of his growing space is on concrete. So if you have concrete, it would be, you know, good. You could sweep it up easy or whatever. But yeah, we have soil. So, um, I have a point that I just want to raise up to Max the one in my garden. And I was thinking about using the, the uh, bale just to have an outline. Like a retaining wall? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would that work? Um, let's look at your landscape before I say yes. Um, just because they do fall apart. So, you, sometimes, like I've seen people who have like, a, a pretty sharp decline in areas, but a good enough amount of sun, and they cut like a terrace garden. Like they make yeah. flat areas, mm -hmm. um, so but remember these break down. So if they, you know, if it's if you're putting them at the bottom of a hill and the water's washing down the hill, um, they're going to break down pretty fast. So just be aware of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So containers, these are awesome. If you don't have a lot of space, um, containers are excellent. Just know that it's like a fish in an aquarium. So they need more care. They don't have um, a lot of room to spread out. There's certain things that are great containers, especially like shallow rooted things, like lettuces. Those are real easy. Um, root crops don't do so well in these because roots need more room. Um, I mean, you can grow and you'll get like you know little bits of you know they'll be smaller. Um, tomatoes do great. There's way too many tomato plants in here. Somebody got real fancy and tried to put like three or four tomato plants in there. Tomatoes like room. Um, we'll talk about that um, more when we get kind of to the end of the presentation. Um, but yeah, do the slow release fertilizers and make sure that they get afternoon shade if you're doing some, um, uh, some, some summer crops. Summer crops are the most um, popular uh, for people to grow, tomatoes, peppers, things like that. But just make sure that every morning you're watering them and you're paying attention to like how wet the soil is, how the plants look um, if you're growing um, food crops in, in the summertime here. Um, yeah, so water daily, sometimes even twice daily. Hey Cheryl, just yes. a question. Sure. Last summer out at Briggs, there was that guy, Mr. Ali, yeah. who had an insane tomato bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, I'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. Did you ever figure out what he did? Um, I don't know. He had tons of tomato plants, but not that many tomatoes. Oh, okay. So he didn't have like a real, but what was interesting about his bed is they were planted very thickly, but they didn't get sick. When right. everybody else's were like, <laughs> His were beautiful and green, and there was like leaves touching the ground, and totally not normally how you would do it. But I think he just fertilized the heck out of them. Okay. And um, but I don't know what plant stock he got a hold of because none of them got sick. So um, and, and I don't know if he just planted them later in the season. Sometimes that's what it is for tomato plants. Longer. As they get older, they get sicker. Um, and so I think he planted those a little later. But I'll check in with him. He'll probably give yeah. us not really. Cool answer. He's a cool, he's a very cool guy. Um, so good soil backbone of a healthy, productive vegetable garden. 
Um, it needs to drain well and hold water and nutrients to support beneficial microorganisms. So, you know, soil is not just dirt, it's actually like this community of stuff and beings that are constantly breaking things down. There's activity going on in the soil all the time. If your soil is healthy, there's like, it's like a city in there, you know, with, it is, it's, there's things being consumed, things being grown in there, um, little animals living in there, bacteria, fungus living in there. You want um, a robust microbiological environment in your soil, which is why you need a compost. Sand can't hold water or nutrients. We're lucky we don't have that problem. But don't add sand to your clay thinking that it's going to drain because sand and clay makes bricks. So don't <laughs> add sand. Don't think like, yeah, this is what it needs some sand. Don't do that. Just add compost and everything will be fine. Um, because there's going to be a little bit of water space. There's going to be some air space. Um, there's going to be spaces that little animals are moving through. So soil is, you know, very fundamental to making sure if you do it right the first time, you don't have to mess with it anymore. Um, organic matter. Gotta have organic matter. Preparing the soil. So this, you can rent one of those. Um, that's a tiller. So this guy's like ripping it up, which is great. He's getting, you know, this soil looks pretty good. He's cutting in some compost. But then if you're if you're doing your raised beds, you would only do this one time. So you're not gonna rip it up every, every uh, summer. Um, organic matter improves all soils, especially ours, like we talked about. Cultivate at least six to eight inch deep. I usually, when I'm doing that first one, I usually try to do 12 inches if I can, um, and add each year. So if this one says that you're supposed to be tilling every year, but I, I practice no-till gardening and I get the absolute best results. Cover cropping, though, is amazing. So um, I think I have, I can't remember if I put them in your office. There's like a case of those cover crop pamphlets. Maybe I gave them all away. I can't remember, but I was looking for them this morning to see if I could pass them out. But cover crop. Okay, so one little cool thing that you can do, and you can suggest to others when people ask you questions out there in the community, because you're going to say, oh, I'm a master gardener, and they're going to automatically assume that you know like everything, like you have like, a master's degree in horticulture. Okay? okay. So, you know, what, what you can do, and what I recommend that people do, is that um, the North Carolina State has done an outstanding job in their horticulture department of making um, research available to the public. So, you know, not only through this program, but then also online. So if there's a topic like cover crops or peaches or pecans, you can type that into your search bar and type <laughs> NCSU after, and all the extension documents will come up. So that's really lovely because then you're not looking at like um, a research paper that maybe somebody, you know, the general public can't read. It's actually repackaged in a way that people can understand. So um, that's a great recommendation. So check out cover crops, um, the cover crops that grow in our area. Um, what's great is you're growing your own organic material and, um, and you're also choking out weeds. These are, this is an excellent way to um, maintain a garden. So they call them green manures. Um, so it says to till them in, but actually you just gotta kind of mow them down. And then you can turn them in with a fork or something like that if you want. You're not gonna run a tiller over these. Um, but you grow these, so something like clover, these are leguminous plants. Um, I don't know if we've, we've talked about legumes yet, um, for, for you all yet, but all legumes, whether it be a bean plant, a peanut plant, a mesquite tree, a clover plant, um, these plants, they, um, they have a symbiotic relationship with what they call rhizobia, which are little bacteria, and the little bacteria edge their way into the, the roots of the plants and create these little nodules. And it's a symbiotic relationship where the rhizobia trap atmospheric nitrogen and feed it to the plant, and the plant traps sunlight and air and feeds sugar to the rhizobia. So it's a, it's a you know, interdependent relationship. All of them do this. So when you grow a cover crop like this and you chop it up and leave it on the surface of the soil and let it break down or put it in your compost pile, you're actually feeding the soil nitrogen. So, um, but it's the leguminous crops that do that. And there's lots of different kinds of legumes out there. Um, cow, pea, soybeans, millet, summer oats, hairy veg, crimson clover, these are all legumes. Um, but you don't ever want to let them go to seed. You grow them until they're like flowering and then you chop them down. Because if they go to seed, you're going to have weeds in there. They're just going to keep coming up and coming up. So it's best if you let them to flower and then cut them off. Oh, there you see. Okay. Throw your organic materials. Millet, this is beautiful. Um, you can let it go to seed if you want to, and then the birds can come in and eat it, but again, it'll be pretty weedy. 
Um, but this is a plant that has a lot of leaves. And this is not a legume, though. Um, it's a true grain. Um, but yeah, you can cover crop with this as well. And it's kind of nice, like during the summertime when it's brutal out, if we're giving a bed a rest, we'll plant it with peanuts. Um, peanuts are a wonderful, they're super fun for kids. Like whenever we have those summer groups that come through Briggs, I do, I do little tours for church groups and lots of camps and things like that. They're always looking for something free and fun for kids to do. So I'll show them how, you know, the peanuts actually grow under the ground. And it's nice because it chokes out all the weeds. I don't have to maintain that bed. You throw those, you know, cocktail peanuts in there and you just let them go. And then, I don't know, and oh, funny story, uh, I called up, um, we actually have a peanut lab at NCSU. All they grow is peanuts. And so I asked, oh, can I get some peanuts from you? You know, because it's in CSU, like, and they're like, how many do you want? I'm like, oh, I'm going to grow like a quarter of an acre of peanuts. I was just estimating because um, I have a buddy garden seeds and they wanted to do it too. And so I came in and saw this lab and they gave me a 50 pound bag of peanuts <laughs> and then like 15 or 20 single pound bags of different strains that they had grown. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to show kids how to make peanut butter. That's why I want to grow them for the summertime. And they're like, you don't make peanut butter. Peanuts. Like, Why? What's wrong with them? They're like, you get those ugly Georgia peanuts if you want to make peanut butter. Like, These are beautiful cocktail peanuts. These are supreme oh. cocktail peanuts. You know what I, mean? I was like, oh, sorry, but, <laughs> but it was awesome. I mean, we had so many peanuts. I had to give them away in the office, and they're like, come back next year. I'm like, great. So uh, we'll probably be passing out peanuts sometime this summer. Um, but that was really wonderful. We planted them. They, they're beautiful plants. They kind of look a little bit like indigo plants with these sort of lobed leaves. They have these beautiful little yellow flowers. They totally choke out the weeds. So you can just, you know, if there's something that looks gorgeous and it's low maintenance. And in the summer when it's brutally hot, it's either like dead of summer and dead of winter. It's planned neglect, a benign neglect in my garden at home, especially. Like if I'm going to go and sweat it out of parades with volunteers, my tomatoes are just going to have to deal with it out in my backyard until it cools down. Um, but yeah, so peanuts are an excellent cover crop in that regard. And so we chop up the greens <laughs> and either choke out the weeds further in the fall or we put them in the compost pile and that, that nitrogen ends up. So the nitrogen doesn't end up in the soil just because you grow it there. You actually have to degrade the leaves back into the soil in order to get the nitrogenous benefit. Um, so, uh, so certain cover crops, they'll let these dry out first before they chop them in and you're getting mostly carbon out of that and the weed suppression, which is good. Um, sometimes it's not incorporated at all. You can chop it up, let it die on the surface. It's still choking out weeds, and then you cut a little hole and you stick a transplant in there. So you already have ready-made mulch, um, and it's feeding the soil. A lot of those subterranean creatures, like worms and things, they're top feeders. So you want to put things on the surface of the soil because they're coming up and going down and moving around in the, in the soil um, eating. So uh, this is a really great way to not have to buy things to incorporate into your soil. You can grow your own. Yeah, but no, it doesn't. It does if you let it go all the way to this. It definitely will. Or you can go out and just chop them off. This is, you know, amazing bird seed. That's how most people recognize it here. In other areas of the world, this is their primary staple crop. But um, here in America, people will recognize them like with bird petals and things. So, uh, but yeah, it can it can cause problems. But you don't you wouldn't have to let it go all the way to that. It just depends on if you're a bird or not. Um, so, um, what to grow, how much, when to plant, and crop rotation. So, we're talking about planning now. How are we doing on time? Did you guys get a break at 10 30? Yeah. Okay, all right. Keep going. All right. Deciding what to grow. So, if your family doesn't like radishes, don't grow them. Um, you know, so although radishes are great, these are super duper easy. So, we'll talk about that. Um, what to grow in our climate. I mean, my husband, like, we lived in Arizona. He's a fourth generation tree selling. He has family that's been there since like the 1700s, and um, uh, so it was very difficult for him to leave, and we had 10 pretty citrus trees in our yard. So I had one of those industrial juicers because we had so much fruit. It was just everything from kumquat all the way up to uh, grapefruit and everything in between, and it, you know, it was just winter time. It was just me constantly juicing. I had like a bicep that would just juice all this fruit because we couldn't eat it fast enough. You'll drive all over the desert and you'll see fruit just rotting on the ground. People don't take care of their trees and they continue to produce. So, um, and now we come here and he's like, yeah, you're going to grow a lemon and an avocado tree. I'm like, you better build me a greenhouse because there's no <laughs> way we can grow that. you got to grow it in a pot and bring it in the greenhouse. So um, there's certain things that are going to grow here and certain things that aren't. And you will, as master gardeners, have people come to you and insist they have to have this certain kind of apple 
or you know what's wrong with my you know certain kind of peach that I brought. It's like well if it doesn't grow here, I mean because there's so much water here, there's a lot more fungus, bugs, stuff that you wouldn't have to deal with in other places. Or you know say it's in New York. You know, they have a lot more chill hours in New York, and certain fruit trees need that, but they also have really hard freezes, which kill a lot of pests. When we don't have a hard freeze in the winter, which we really didn't this winter, I know that the pests in the summer are going to be bananas. And so with climate change, I know that, you know, there's certain things that we're going to be able to grow here year-round that we didn't before. Um, it, you know, year to year, it really changes because we're right in the middle. We're a mid-Atlantic state. So given from year to year, it's going to be different. Um, and we just kind of have to pay attention to how um, the climate is changing with us and how we're going to evolve in the kind of crops that we grow. So what grows in our climate, you know, or you'll have somebody say, you know, I really want a fescue lawn. Why is it dying in the summer? Because it's hot and fescue doesn't like it hot. And they'll argue with you about it. It's like, it's just, it is, like it's nature. I can't make it do the thing that you want it to do. So, um, you know, just be, just be wary of, of that. Um, but yeah, whatever grows in our climate is really the best. So pay attention to those. And there's some, there's been a lot of people who, you know, at NCSU who've done a lot of plantings and tried things out. Um, so there are certain varieties that grow really well here and other varieties that don't. Um, so yeah, whatever you're gonna can, pickle, sell. Um, we have a gardener at Grace named Evans and he is a champion. He has the greenest thumb of anybody I've ever seen. And it's just him and his wife at home. And they will, he will grow like, uh, 150 pounds of bok choy. He's like, you want some bok choy? And it's like the kids, I had to, I have to hide it with the collard greens when we give it to the food bank, because if you just put bok choy in the fridge, they won't recognize it and they won't take it. So I break it apart and I like clandestinely put it so when you look at the package, you might see a white stem, but mainly it looks like collard greens so that they actually end up, so, you know, because then people might experiment with it or something. Um, so it just depends on what your family is going to eat is based on, but you know, give stuff a try, but if you, you know, if you hate asparagus, don't go through the trouble of putting in that perennial bed. So, um, how much are you going to use? Um, use yield information or personal needs to decide how much to plant. Um, I always err on the side of planting more because your neighbors are going to love fresh vegetables. It's great cooking diplomacy to bring like a basket of fresh veg to your neighbors. You know, if your dog gets out next time or somebody unknown pulls up in front, they're gonna pay attention to your house a little bit better. So, uh, you know, and peppers, again, very expensive. I would grow those all the time. Um, always better to start small, that's true, because you don't wanna get discouraged, you know? Okay, starting vegetables. Okay, so you can start some from seed. Root crops don't like it. A nice general, um, uh, rule of thumb of whether something goes directly in the ground or something that likes to be transplanted or can be transplanted um, is kind of the smaller the seed, generally speaking, you can start transplants with those. If it's a larger seed or a root crop, I mean, carrot seeds are real small, but it's a root crop. They don't like to be transplanted. They, they need to be direct seeded. Um, beans, it's a really large seed, doesn't really like to be transplanted. Corn either, it needs to go directly in the ground. So, um, and you can check these out here when you come up during break to get some little samples and we can talk about that. Carrots, um, and, carrots and pea pods? I don't know. I mean, you could, but like, I mean, and then drop it in the ground after that, but they're so cold hardy. I just put them directly on the ground. You know, there's certain, especially like the fruit crops in the summer, those are the ones that you're usually gonna be starting early because, you know, you want big, strong plants. Um, oh, oops, what did I do? Okay. Um, but, um, you know, or, you know, mustards and stuff like that for the winter time. Um, but I mean, with root crops, they, they do so well. Like I'll seed a bunch in the fall and just leave them there. And I don't even, I used to be, when I first started, a very anal retentive gardener. Everything had to be in perfect rows and everything had to be perfectly spaced and I was measuring things. And now I just like throw it out there and hope for the best. And it's great. Stuff will sprout in the, in the fall and the, the seeds are all real close together. And then you'll leave them there all winter and you go out and harvest the big ones because they'll continue to grow. They'll crowd each other and some other ones will stay small and puny. But then when you rip out that big one, that little puny one has room to grow. So I kind of like sow seeds a little bit closer together when it comes to root crops because they will kind of, you know, you can pull some up and then they'll continue to grow. So, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, pea pots are expensive and 
you know, you might as well just throw it on the dirt and give it a whirl. You know, seeds can be pretty cheap. Uh, so, yeah, some are grown um, directly in the garden and grow in place. Um, and they, yeah, we're talking about how large seeds um, and root crops don't like to be transplanted. Um, other crops, you know, you want stuff for a larger growing season. Like some people, like with tomatoes, I always recommend doing two shifts of tomatoes in the summer. Do an early shift of tomatoes, and then those are going to kind of get sickly. Rip that plant out. Don't, you know. Sure. Rip the plant out if it starts to get diseased. I know it's hard to kill things, especially when you just get started. Um, but if, a, if especially a tomato plant starts to look terrible, rip it out and put another <laughs> one in. Because if that plant is going to be a little bit younger, and it's going to be less disease prone. You'll end up getting more tomatoes out of two plants than you would one. Yes? So right now, if you planted seeds now, mm -hmm. and they're coming up and they're doing okay, yeah. when would you plant your next seed, seeds for your seedlings for the second one? End of March, beginning of April. And then put them in in the late summer. Yeah. But I would rip out a sick plant. It's hard. It's the hardest with tomatoes because people work real hard for them. But just be ruthless. Um, okay. So yeah, some like to be transplanted, some don't. Um, so seed sown direct. You can see all of these are large. Or and of course potatoes as their roots. And then these are all roots. Oh, well, not all of them. Some of these are roots. Yeah, that one is too. Yes, no. But that one you can direct seed. Mustards you can also do. Uh, any of the mustards or brassicas you can do as transplants. And then you can see these are all the like fruits in the summer right here, some flowers. Um, and then yes, of course, sweet potatoes. You have to do slips with those anyway. Um, okra you can transplant, but I usually direct seed it because it is, yeah, it's just easy to do. Lettuce and spinach, yes, you can, you know, pre-seed them or not. Talk to Catherine Hamilton, our compost queen. She's a excellent resource um, here at the Master Gardeners. She figured out a way to, um, uh, she has the most, she's most gorgeous lettuce, let me get out of your way here, um, the most gorgeous lettuce, and she actually sprouts it on little um, like wet sponges, which I thought was really cool. So there's lots of different ways to do things, ask around. Um, you can see how this is planted very close together. This is how I like to do, if you want the little baby lettuces, like a mescaline mix, plant them close together and they won't get very big, and you can just go out, and it's cut and coming in. You just, or, pluck it off, and then you can just keep coming back to that bed of lettuce. Some people like to have a big head of lettuce. I never grow a head of lettuce and break it off unless I'm giving it to a friend or neighbor. Um, I just, even with a romaine head or something, I break off the outer leaves and I can keep coming back to that same head of lettuce for a couple of months and harvesting off of it before it gets too hot. So, um, yeah. Okay, uh, cucumber, squash, zucchini, pumpkins, and melons. These are great to put in the corner of a bed and let grow out over into a space that you're not walking. Um, in the community garden, we usually grow them somewhere else because if you grow them in the bed, you have to wind them around and around and around because one of the rules are you can't grow out in the pathway. And then all you get is like three watermelons out of your bed for the summer. So, yes? With the community garden, can you have a fence around your, like, you know, have a little gate, mm -hmm. like a little fence, and you can have it all on the fence? People put little trellises around the side. Um, but it's such a small area, and you're not it's supposed not to be big enough. You can't block. step into, yeah. So, um, yeah, so you can't, because you don't really want to step on your bed and compress right. the yeah. soil. Um, but yeah, we have so much room in the orchard, you know, that's kind of our experimental growing space for the most part. Would that make it better for the, um, <clears throat> to keep the pass away too, because you have a separate? Yes, so we are uh, instituting a bit of a policy with squash this year because squash is evil. Um, and well, it's not squash, it's squash bugs that are evil. And we'll yes, talk about yes. that when we get to squash. Uh, yes. uh, they have a lot of pests. And the issue with community gardening is like if you ignore your garden in your backyard and it gets wrapped by pests, it doesn't bother anybody but you. But if you have a bed right now, if you have somebody who has an immaculate bed that's constantly taking care of it, and then they've got somebody who's slacking over here and they never come around, they'll be pick off, they'll diligently pick off every squash bug, and then these guys over here are like, awesome, no competition, and they'll just move right over to that person's plants. So it affects everybody. Um, so this year we're gonna be ruthless with tomatoes and squash. I told people if if you want to grow squash and I don't see you every 48 hours coming out here to pick these things off of here, I will rip your plants out. I'm sorry if I break your heart, but it prevents the people who are there all the time from getting upset because the people that really participate are there all the time. They're my priority to keep them happy. Um, I want everybody to be happy, but mm, I don't need my like I, my people who are into it. I don't want them discouraged. It's like mm, yeah. At the Duke Garden, they just stopped growing them for a couple of years because they had such a problem. With right. 
Yeah. And they said, we're just not going to squash. Yep. So I, I discussed that squashing tomatoes up there. Maybe we should take a year off tomatoes. And everybody was like, no! So it's like, okay, well, you're going to text me pictures of your dying plants, but this isn't. Just to let you know it is going to happen kind of thing. So there's, you know. Yeah, my garden at home, knock on wood, I never have any problems because I have great crop rotation. I never grow more than one squash plant. You know, it's just, and I don't have a lot of vegetable gardens around me, but at Briggs, this is stuff that's been grown there for eight, nine years in a row, the same stuff in the same beds all the time. Onions and garlic, these are a great plant. I love the set it and forget it stuff for the winter time. You throw some of these in and just let them grow up. They kind of die back in the winter and they come right back for spring. Um, don't try to grow, like onions, that's of course you wouldn't do this, but people will like a certain kind or they'll buy like garlic from the grocery store and kind of try to plant it in their garden. Don't do that because it's irradiated so it won't sprout. Also, you're probably growing garlic from China or California, which is not the variety that grows here. If you want to grow like a local garlic, just go to the farmer's market and, you know, talk to whoever has garlic there and say, hey, did you grow this here? How far away were you? And then, um, then bring it home and you can just bury it an inch under the soil. And each um, clove of garlic that you put in is going to give you a whole head of garlic like four or five months later. So types of vegetables. Open pollinated, so heirloom varieties, most people know this for, uh, for tomatoes, of course. Um, you can save the seed and they'll come true to type. Um, tomatoes aren't pollinated by bees. I mean, a bee will fly by it and pollinate it just from the vibration, um, but uh, they uh, usually are not pollinated by pollinators. Most of them are self-pollinating. A hybrid is a cross between two parents. If you save the seeds from this, it's not going to come out true to type. It'll look a little different. It'll look like maybe one of its parents. Um, and then an F1 hybrid is the the first time one gets crossed. So um, these are always a little bit more expensive because they're going to have like whatever they, they you know, uh, did the cross for like um, certain kinds of wilts or something like that, that uh, resistant trait is expressed the strongest in the F1 hybrid. So that's why these are the most expensive ones. Um, but they're worth it if you have a lot of diseases in your landscape. Um, planting times. This is really important. Um, you can grow crops outside of certain planting times, but um, they're going to be weaker. So, mm -hmm. like for instance, like um, anything in the, the, the grass polaraceae, so cabbage, collards, kohlrabi, um, broccoli, cauliflower, all of those do well in cooler weather. And the only time you start to see the pests is when it starts to get warm. <laughs> then the pests can actually come and attack the plants because they're weaker. So also those are more bitter. So you're either, the, those, that family of plants is gonna be more bitter when it's hotter. Um, you've heard like collards are sweeter with the frost. It's true because they don't have to create, a lot of those bitter flavors are actually the plant trying to create its own pesticide, saying just to try to make itself less delicious to chewing pests. And so if it's cooler, those pests, their, their life cycle, there is in dormancy. And so they, they don't have to create as much of those, you know, sulforaphanes and things like that to taste bitter um, and for, you know, for the chewing pests. So they're actually a lot nicer for us to consume. Um, so yeah, cool season, warm season. And another way you can think of for cool season crops, we're mainly going for the leaves, the shoots, and the roots. Okay, and then in the summer, we're going for fruits because you need more sunlight because a fruit is the most expensive thing biologically that a plant can make, you know, generally speaking. Um, you need a lot of sun in order to create a fruit. And I mean botanically a fruit, things with seeds inside of them. So that means, you know, squashes, uh, cucumbers, uh, anything that has like things, something to pick off of it, a tomato. Um, so just because in nutritional programs, they don't call them fruits, botanically they're fruits. Okay. Yeah. Herbs or leaves, they're, and, and herbs are a little bit different, so there's soft-stemmed herbs and there's woody-stemmed herbs. Um, the woody-stemmed herbs um, grow pretty much year-round in their perennial, whereas the soft-stemmed herbs, they're annuals. They grow, they put off seeds, and they die each year. Um, but that's kind of nice because, like, uh, <laughs> when they put off seeds, a lot of times I'll strip the seeds off. I let them go to seed. I strip the seeds off, and I just throw them down in the garden bed, and then they just come back up again when the soil and when the soil is the right temperature and the light is just right and all of that, they'll just come up again. So um, that 
because that's me now lazy gardening. And it's great. You walk out and it's like, oh, cilantro, awesome. You know, <laughs> it just, they just come up. The poppies are awesome that way too. I'll take the poppies and shake them around. And then they just come up in the bed. And if I don't want them, I rip them out. But then if I get like a patch of something, I can always take the little plants, separate them, and then plant them where I want them. It's just kind of more low maintenance way of gardening. If you're a homeowner, it's just kind of nice to have the things come up. Um, what else did I want to tell you about? It'll come up again. Hold on. Okay. Um, so, uh, planting all your plants at one time, all are ready at the same time. So, how we were talking about like the carrots, you know, you sprinkle the seeds, and like all of them are going to be, generally speaking, ready to go at the same time. Unless you overseed, like I do, and some of them get kind of choked out, then you can um, pull pull them up, and then they'll have space to to grow. But if you plant, some people will just sprinkle them very lightly, and those will come up, and then every two weeks they'll continue to seed like with lettuces and, and things like that, especially the, the root crops and the leaf crops, um, then you have, you have little seedlings always coming up and always a crop to harvest once that first um, uh, growing season has happened. So if you have a really long growing season, and like we do here, but so you can get like multiple crops of lettuce or multiple crops of, um, uh, of like um, uh, carrots or radishes, you just seed every couple of weeks and you always have seedlings coming up while you're pulling out some mature ones. So successive planting. How often you plant depends on how quickly things grow. Like a radish is like 30 days. Those are super fun. Um, for kids, I would always plant the super mild ones because then and they like dip them in ranch for peanut butter, which is weird, but actually kind of good. It sounded disgusting when I, I was in a classroom. We were cutting up radishes from the garden. They're like, ooh, peanut butter. And I was like, that's weird. And I tried it and I was like, oh, because it kind of mellows the pepperiness of it. But radishes are fun because they're real easy to grow. They don't need very much room. They're beautiful, and you get an excellent harvest out of them. They're ready in a month. So that's kind of nice. Lettuce, radish, mustard. Um, and then there's you know melons, tomatoes, peppers, broccoli, collards. They, they're 60 years. Like the 100 day stuff is a lot of the, the summer stuff. Okay, garden calendars. So um, February, early March, plant full season crops outside through early summer. Um, and April and May is the warm season crops because any of the fruity stuff in the summertime can't tolerate frost. They don't like it. Um, and then late summer. Um, so what the sort of, um, you know, prevailing on, on, on these calendars, it'll basically show that like nothing exists in December and January. And that's not true. If you get your crops in, in the fall, rather than ripping them out, cover them with a row cover, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and then you can go out and harvest all winter long. They grow very slowly, or they, they kind of go into a little bit of a dormancy. Some of them look a little rough, because if it's like a freezing night or something, they'll look a little bummed out. Um, don't go out there in the morning if the plant is frozen and start picking off of it. Wait until, especially with the brassicas, um, if you let the sun warm them up, they have their own antifreeze, and they'll be fine. They'll totally recover. But if you go messing with them when they're frozen, when the water in their cells is frozen, you'll burst their cell walls and they'll die. So just leave them alone, and then around noon, come back, and you can pick off of them. So um, I overwinter lots of stuff. Spinach loves the frost. It loves, it loves like snow on top of it. There's nothing happier than spinach and snow on top of it. My cabbage and collards, too, with that snow in the snow. Yeah, it actually insulates them. Yeah. So it gets a little monkey when it, when it, like, uh, when it warms up and then it melts. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. You can go out there and they do just fine. Um, okay, don't plant the same crop in the same spot year after year after year because some of the pests, their life cycle is, you know, they do their thing on the plant and destroy stuff, and then they, like, nest in the soil underneath or in leaf litter nearby, and then they come back. So that just keeps happening. Or same thing with diseases in the soil, like different um, fungal infections or bacterial infections can hang out right there, wherever you were at, and you put another tomato there, and you're like, oh, awesome, thanks for my favorite host. Awesome, right here. So if you, if you are gonna put in a bed, try to pay attention in your little calendar, you know, your little, uh, your little garden journal that you're gonna, you're gonna start, just a little three ring binder, so with your soil tests and your, you know, you can, 
cut out the labels and things, or if you buy like a fruit tree and it has that little tab on it, take it off and tape it in there because you'll lose it, it'll blow away, and you're like, was this a plum? What kind? And you're gonna need to know that if you have an apple, say have two apples, they have to bloom at the same time to cross-pollinate each other in order to make apples, and if one of them dies and you can't figure out, wait, what kind of apple was that? Because there's lots of different kinds of apples that bloom at different times. And so if you buy a different apple and you got one that's blooming now and then another month the other one blooms, you're not helping yourself. So you know you want to you want to keep that and, and your crop rotation is going to go in there. Just a general idea. You don't have to be totally anal about it unless you want totally OCD, go for it. Like write down everything. But just kind of some general stuff. This stuff you bought, the plants you got, you know, just kind of jot some notes down. And this is the most important wise because of, of your is uh, your crop rotation. Question. Yeah. Change the soil, absolutely. Like, I mean, if you grow, like in the fall, you grow some, you know, brassicas, and then you want to like feed the soil and pop a tomato in there in the summer, great. Give it a whirl. But then dump that out, wash it out with a little bleach water, and then, or even just rinse it out real, real good, scrub it out, and then uh, renew your, your soil. That's really the best thing you can do. Um, this reduces pest problems, insect disease, and the weeds. We talked about that. Um, and so, oh, you must know which plants are related to plant rotation. So, um, broccoli and cabbage are in the same family. So, you would not plant anything in that family um, until you move it around. So, um, brassicas are the mustard family. Brassicas to me are totally fascinating. I love them. I love eating them. I love growing them. I love their varieties. Um, I love how they're just, you know, just. The best little buddy in the garden you don't have to mess with them much and they're just happy um, i also like uh their sort of history because um there's like you know the older race the rest of the older aces that are really kind of european and then there's like the breast of arapas that are like uh asian um, there's all of these different brassicas that have split off from you know all over around the world they had a common ancestor at some point and they split off all over the world and we have everything from canola which is rapeseed oil that's a mustard that's a brassica and then we also have um, broccoli and they all came from the same family i think it's totally fascinating so yes i love brassicas um curcumins uh, squash family so cucumber squash zucchini winter squash pumpkins cantaloupes and watermelons so um this is a really wonderful family. Uh, just know that they can be a little bit finicky in the heat, so and they can be prone to pests, downy mildews, things like that. So, uh, whereas you can set it and forget it with these guys, they grow in colder weather, so there's just a lot less pests. Anything that grows in warmer weather, you're going to have to be on top of it more, and it's harder to be outside when it's 100% humidity and 90 degrees. So just be mindful of that when you put your stuff in. Fall and spring is like heaven here, like you know. North Carolina is gorgeous in the fall and spring, so long as it doesn't rain for weeks on end. Um, but otherwise, like if it's if it's summertime, it can be really brutal. So don't overdo it in the summertime. It's just hard because that's where all the most favorite crops are, the peppers and the tomatoes and things. So just be mindful of that. More rain, more pests, more heat, all of those things together. And you have to be out there more often looking at them and picking things off of them. Also, when it gets too hot, these certain types of cucumbers. Um, they get really bitter. I recommend the Armenian variety. They're actually a gourd, but they behave like a cucumber. They can grow in like 120 degree heat. So whether it's 100% humidity or 0% humidity, um, those are my those are the only kind I grow in my home garden because I can put them out there and not mess with them. And they're still edible when they're this big. So I just have to pull the seeds out of them. Um, so those are the ones I recommend. Um, Solanaceae, this is my favorite family, uh, but they are the most finicky. So your tomatoes, your peppers, eggplants, and potatoes, um, these are very disease prone. So um, these are the most important thing to rotate. So don't grow tomatoes and then potatoes the next year in that same spot. Um, you want to move them around. Um, legumes, bean family, also super easy to grow. I like bush beans because they, you know there's bush beans or there's whole beans. I love a bush bean because they all just stay nice and short. I don't have to mess around with trellis. Um, I'm not a big like mobile trellis person. If I have to grow something on a trellis, I put it by a chain link fence. It's just easier. Um, but yeah, these are wonderful. Um, and then the, the alliums. So I've never really grown like the full onions because onions are a pretty cheap vegetable to use. Um, I'll grow different rare kinds of weird garlic. Or um, you can just get some onions. Like I have onions like this to just live in my garden all the time. 
So it's yard food. I just walk out there, I'm like, oh, I need some scallions, and I yank a few up. Or I just cut the greens off the top. And those are available year round. They get pretty awful looking in the heat of the summer, but they do just fine with a frost, and, uh, and they just live in that little spot all the time. So um, they also have certain things called walking onions, which are really cool, where rather than putting off a flower, it will actually put off a little onion off the top, and then the weight causes it to fall over, and then another onion will come up. So they're called Egyptian walking onions. And your buddy Pam across the hall that's over there uh, making your snacks, she has a beautiful bed of Dutch and walking onions. Um, so yeah, leek, onions, garlic, leeks, and scallions. Um, vegetables with no close relatives, lettuce and endive. Corn is the largest grass in the world. Corn is not a vegetable, it's a grain, y'all. So a little nutritional public service announcement. There, that is a starch. So uh, it's a grain. Um, uh, sweet potatoes in the mallow family, okra, um, carrots, spinach. Spinach, Swiss chard, and beets are all related together. These are the chenopods. They're also related to like amaranth and quinoa. Uh, okay, so we're, you know, do your little four beds with your four year plan or whatever. You know, if you have a long bed, you can separate it half and half if you want to. Just draw a little picture in your little journal and you can kind of look at it. Um, I'm never like planning exactly where I'm going to put things. I just walk out and go, where did I have that? Mm, I had a tomato there last year. I'm not putting one this year. Once you do it for a few years, you'll remember kind of generally like, oh, that pink Berkeley tie dye tomato gave me those beautiful, yeah, and that was there. Um, but when you're first starting off, write it all down. But here's a great example of this. I also want to put out a little public service announcement. I love the Square Foot Gardening book, but that does not 100% work for us here in North Carolina. So I just, yeah, I just don't, you know, they say like, oh, all you need is one square foot for a tomato. Oh, no, no. The wetter things are, like, yeah, in the desert, that would be fine. You don't pinch the suckers off tomatoes in in the desert because you need to hold on to as much moisture as possible because it never rains. So you can let the plant grow into a big thicket and it shades itself and it's a good thing. Here it will grow fungus and everything will die and you'll be super bummed about it and that fungus or bacteria will like hang out in your soil and attack them next year. So square foot gardening is okay for like scallions, a basil plant, I don't know, not a lot of stuff here. So just. Yeah, you know, people, I've seen, I'll walk into the garden, it'll be a new garden, and they've got the little bridge drawn out, and I'm like, oh no, I'm about to burst their bubble. Uh, but yes, you need a much more room for tomatoes. I know I seem to be harping on tomatoes, but it's everybody's favorite. So um, you need nutrition and fertilization, watering, and pest management. So nutrients, start with soil sampling for sure. Um, base your rates on soil test results and recommendations for your crop. Remember, do your bed right the first time, and it'll treat you right for many years to come. So um, uh, incorporate into soil before you plant or side dress after something is planted. So there's different ways that you can do it um, to make sure your plants are well fed through the season. Um, talked about the pH from 6 to 6.5, but again, that can go like even 7 to 7.5 depending on where you're at. Um, but really with our particular clay soils, 6 to 6.5 works great. Um, if it's lower than 6, lime should be tilled into the soil because that's your initial till and then you would kind of cut it into the top after that if you absolutely needed it later. Lime takes time to break down which is why when you get your soil test and you pop that in your little garden journal and it says uh, like five pounds per 100 square feet you write down that you added it and you write down the date because then two years later when you do your soil sample again it's going to ask you did you, you know, has lime been put on in the last year or two years? Because lime isn't just changing your soil right away, your pH. It takes time for it to break down. So don't just indiscriminately just throw lime on it. People do that with their lawns all the time. Uh, oh, I put lime on it. How much and when? I don't know. And it's like, oh, no. You know, so just kind of keep an idea, especially if you're doing something where you're changing the pH. Like, that's a pretty big deal. So um, um, something that needs to be tracked a little bit. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so dolomitic lime um, supplies your calcium and magnesium and raises the pH. Um, we tend to have a lot of calcium in our soils anyway though. Um, and that uh, takes care of blossom and rot like melon, with melons, peppers, and tomatoes. But you'll pretty much only see it on tomatoes that I've ever seen. It's a problem with low calcium. I, I have not seen any, hardly any blossom and rot. Um, 
here in North Carolina because our soils do have quite a bit of calcium in them. The only time I really see a boss <coughs> can rot on a tomato is if somebody has stressed their plant by not watering it, so it can't uptake the calcium, and then it'll look, you know, the plant will look terrible already. So if you stress the plant, it keeps it from uptaking nutrients like it needs, but you know, you don't need to like host the, the our soils with a lot of calcium. Um, you know, there's certain others, maybe on the east coast, or, I mean on the um, on our, our, our coast, where it's sandy and there isn't a lot of nutrients, you might have that issue, but not necessarily in the Piedmont, unless you're stressing things out. But that's what it looks yeah. like. It's a bummer. Okay, fertilizers usually needed to supply some of the nutrients that plants need. Both organic and synthetic fertilizers are available. Synthetic fertilizers usually have higher concentrations of nutrients. And um, organic fertilizers are better for the soil. They encourage microorganisms and are less likely to cause water pollution. Because with organic fertilizers, if you ever see like six, two, seven, <coughs> chances are it's probably organic fertilizer. If you see 10, 10, 10, that is a synthetic fertilizer because it isn't from natural things. So they're able to control exactly what they're putting in it because it isn't made from chicken litter and mushroom compost and all those kinds of things. Um, they're actually, with, with uh, especially in the case of nitrogen, the reason that people don't like synthetic fertilizers besides that people are hosing them all over their lawns and they're ending up in our waterways, um, is also because on the big picture for the environment, you have to use a ton of fossil fuel to trap atmospheric nitrogen to make chemical nitrogen that you put in fertilizer. So that's a lot of times why people don't like to use them. Um, so I always just use organic fertilizer. There's, it is more expensive. I mean, if you have like a resource limited family or something and somebody donated some 10, 10, 10 to them, have them use it, you know? Or if you're using it for your own thing, that's great. Um, but for like for us at Briggs and in my own garden, I spend a little bit more and I get the organic fertilizers because they are feeding the microorganisms. And um, you know, big picture, I like to try to reduce our fossil fuel use as much as possible, but it's really up to the individual. Um, fertilizer is, is uh, necessary for um, so slow release fertilizers are nice because, I mean, and also essential for sandy soils because water does, there's a lot of air space in between sand. Sand is big chunks, whereas clay is like fine, fine silt. So, um, uh, you know, these are great for all kinds of soils, but you need them for sandy soils because then they get trapped in one of those spots and they continue to release fertilizer. Whereas if you put like a liquid fertilizer on there, it's just going to run right through the sand and, and out into the waterway so, or into the environment. Um, so yeah, so they have organic and they have um, synthetic varieties. Um, and then soluble fer fertilizers, you can dissolve them in water or you can sprinkle them and they will dissolve in water. And those are the 10, 10, 10s that you'll see like at your big box stores. Um, and then liquid fertilizers are nice. Manure tea, this is where you can get like compost or you can get like, um, uh, like uh, bat guano or worm guano or whatever. You put it in a bag and then you soak it in water for a couple of days, and then you can do a foliar feeding, which is almost like an intravenous feeding for a plant. If you go out and you put a fine mist on the plants, like underneath their leaves, the stomata will open in the morning, and you do like a fine mist, and it's almost like an intravenous feeding for them. They'll boost really quickly. Um, or you can just pour it on the ground, and it just takes a little while, sort of like whether you got an intravenous injection or if you took a pill, it's gonna take longer if you dump it on the roots. Um, but you can burn and kill your plants if you give them an intravenous feed of, feeding of something that is not um, super diluted. So just keep that in mind. Look those two things up, foliar feedings. And you'll see that on directions a lot of times. You'll see foliar feeding, and that's what it is. Just put it in a spray bottle, go out first thing in the morning when the stomata are open. Don't try to do it at noon because the stomata are all closed, but in the morning it works great. Um, but yeah, you can, you can feed your plants in a, in a whole bunch of different ways. Fish emulsion is great because all it is is like waste from fish into you know the fish industry and they break it all down it's real rich in nitrogen it stinks but it does deter some pests because it stinks uh, but it is a very good fertilizer for sure and then miracle grow they have organic varieties or you can just use the regular miracle grow either way so good for a pest boost and these are absolutely necessary if you have uh, potted plants that need to be fed more often because again it's like a fish in an aquarium they need um, a little bit more attention and intervention because they have less room to move around and pull things from the soil. So um, both organic and synthetic fertilizers, the analysis must be started on the back. So it's always N, P, K, okay? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, always, okay? 
here you can then. Numbers are percentages, and nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order. So why don't I stop here for a second so everybody can take a break so I don't feel like forever. Um, feel free to come up and get some seeds if you'd like, and I can talk about these. Or I'll get a couple of